Then he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. I wanted to extract out of that a common, uh, well, it's highly un uncommon, but that the, those that he called, those same ones that he called unto him are the same ones that he wanted to be with. He wanted them to be with him. There's something about being with Jesus that resolves a lot of problems. There's something about being with him that, that will calm you to the point to where you'll be able to endure with patience the race that's set before you. He's the one that ordained them. He's the one that called them. He's the one that, that led them up to this moment in time when all he had to say is, come and follow me. And these men would leave everything that they knew behind. And immediately, immediately, well, we all know anyone who's received the call knows that that's exactly how it is. When, when you see and you hear the call, all this, the, all this stuff that seemed like it was so important, seemed like it was the main thing, became secondary at best, usually just willingly left it all behind to come and seek the master. Well, who will come to Jesus? Well, ultimately, remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. No, no. If anybody's going to make their way to God, they're going to have to come through Jesus. Now, it only makes sense then that God gave some to Jesus, right? To Jesus, that's what he said. The ones that the Father gave him, he says, I have lost none except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. But Jesus is very careful when he talks about those that are his. It's very guarded. It's the ones that the Father gave him. One time the multitudes came to Jesus. This is what he said to them. Luke 14, 25, and there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and his mother and his wife and his brother and his sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now this is the friendly Jesus now. This is what he said to them. He said, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus will set up roadblocks. You want to follow me? You want to casually follow me? You can't. I won't let you. Either it's, you're going to give up everything, leave your nets, and come and follow me, or you really don't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. In other words, Jesus won't teach you anything. Even if, if you initially, there was a man to come to Jesus, and he said, good master, tell me what I have to do to obtain Jesus shut it down right then. And all he did is tell him the one thing that he lacked, one thing. But Jesus wasn't going to let it go. Jesus isn't going to let it go. He's going to find that thing that's going to hold you back, and he's going to bring it up. Because it's got to be dealt with. It's got to be taken out of the way. Jesus is a master. He's the master. He knows exactly. He knows what's in men. He created us. Now, see, this is a good thing. It's a good thing because we needed someone to reveal these things that we don't know anything about. And he's faithful to do that. We'll find that there's a great cost in being associated with Jesus. Now, these men now that he's talking about, and ultimately I'm going to get to this, these men, this is quite a tribute to these men, these 12 that he ordained to be with him. Now, it shows, it reveals a lot of things about the heart of Jesus. He wanted to be with these men. He set them apart to be with them. Of course, now these were the men that were going to go on to, 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 to testify of the Christ. They're going to build a foundation. They're the foundation stones. Look in the book of Revelation. They're there. They're named. These are the ones now that he ordained to be with him. Now, this is quite a work that, uh, that he's going to give them. Go out and preach the gospel to the whole world. Wow. I want to focus for a few minutes on um, a specific point that they should be with him. Now, uh, talking about the called now, talking about the ones that he called, that they would be with him. Remember one, one time in the multitudes he said something? 
unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they, they, they said, oh, how can this man give us his, his body to eat? And they left. Jesus turned to these men. And he said, will you go away too? You're going to go away? Remember, Peter spoke up and he said, to whom shall we go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. Nobody's talking like you. There's nobody. We've been around men before. There's nobody like Jesus. Amen. He's worthy to be around. He's worthy of you casting off everything else if you can be with Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to establish first off that this has got, been God's manner from the very beginning. This isn't like something that Jesus just showed up on the scene and this is just how he is. God's been this way from the very beginning. Now, look, he created man in his own image and in his own similitude. Why? Because he wanted to be with him. When he made the world, everything that God creates, he has a certain affection for it, a certain desire unto it. He made the world, and afterwards he looked at it, and, and God saw that everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. See, it didn't offend him at all. It was an expression of him. He made it. He, it very good. Now, he makes, he makes man in his own image, but there was a, a, a problem, a problem. They fell by transgression. We know by the record, Isaiah tells us, kind of defines us, what, what happens? What, what, what is the defiling thing about sin? Is it makes a barrier between you and God. In other words, he can't be with you. Well, now, for God to want to be with someone and then he can't, see, this is a dilemma. This is a God dilemma. How's God going to save men? And bring them unto himself. Well, he's going to have to deal with this, this sin issue. Of course, this was no, by no accident. There's no surprise to God. Everything's right on course. He's going to display his grace, his glory. He's going to do all this, this in this great salvation. Isaiah said, 59.2, Isaiah 50, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. This is exactly what it is. person wants to, wants to try to uh, preach a gospel that says you can remain in your sins and Jesus love you just the way you are, they're going to have to deal with this. The very thing that separated you from God has got to be taken away. And that's what Jesus has provided. Right. He's done. He's taken away your sins so that he may be with you. In the end, we're going to see God himself is with them. Mm -hmm. see, this has been his desire the whole time. Even though sin had caused a division, even though this was the case, now, this is how potent salvation is. This is how potent the death of Christ is, is that just God thinking about what's going to happen can be a foundation on which he can begin, begin speaking to man based on the fact that Jesus was going to die. We see this all through the scriptures. We consider men, there's been men before Jesus died that found favor with God. How is that? Because Jesus was going to die. See, sin was going to be put away. And so now God can be long-suffering. And God can actually have favor on some men. Now, we'll find also that these are men that God has chosen. These are not, I mean, there's a, as we go through this, you'll see, and I know you already know this, but, but, but there's, there's some men that God hates. He hates them. There's other men that God loves. See, God has preferences. Now, the first two brothers that we read about, now, if the doctrine being preached today that God loves everyone the same, surely it will be demonstrated in the first two brothers, right? Surely we'll be able to see if this doctrine, we can put it to the test right now. What do you say? Genesis 4, 3. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought forth of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Okay, here comes Cain. He's bringing forth an offering. Now we're testing this doctrine. Does God love everyone the same? Okay. And Abel, he also brought forth of the first of his flock into the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. He had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and, unto Cain and his offering... He had not respect. Well, now that right there, that we've just debunked a false doctrine. It's a lie. It's a lie. God doesn't love everyone the same. 
Otherwise, why wouldn't he have loved them the same? He didn't. God had respect unto Abel, and he did not have respect unto Cain. That's what the scripture says. Why? Would anyone stand up and say, I know everything about God. I know why he does everything. This is God we're talking about. And now in Hebrews, it's going to open up a little bit. It's going to show us a little bit more about why God did it. See, God, God's God. Now, he, he shows up. He actually makes it up. He, he speaks to Cain about this because Cain was kind of upset. You didn't respect my offering. He tells him, if you do right, you'll be accepted. What does Cain do? He goes out and he kills his brother. Why? Only one reason, because God received him. Now we learn right off the bat that if you're received by God, just got like there's going to be people that are against you. Uh -huh. People are going to come out against you. So it shouldn't surprise us if we're with Jesus. That's what we're talking about now, being with Jesus. If you're with Jesus, people who are not with Jesus aren't going to like you. That's right. He killed him. Well, after Cain kills Abel, once God once again visits Canaan, he says, what have you done? What have you done? That's what he says. The voice of thy brother blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now remember now, the one that God preferred still had the Lord's ear after he was dead. Still continued. When death didn't separate Cain, I mean Abel from God. Death didn't separate it. He still had God's ear. And God did something about it. What did God do to Cain when he touched one of the ones that he loved? He cursed him. That's what, now, see, we're learning a lot right off the bat. You don't touch somebody that God loves, somebody that God has respect for, you're going to pay a price for it. How about Enoch? Now, Enoch, it's interesting. Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. Now, see, I, I was just thinking about this, about God preferring certain people. God doesn't walk with everybody. He doesn't. He doesn't walk with that. He doesn't have communion with everyone. He did with Enoch. That's what it says. All the days of Enoch were 360 and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Now, could I prove that God wanted to be with Enoch? Well, right there, God took him. He wanted to be with Enoch so much that one day he said, you're not going home. You're coming with me. I'm going to take you. I prefer you. God wanted to be with Enoch. Amen. I mean, this is, this is, well, this was kind of very edifying to me. You're that kind of person. Are you in Christ Jesus? You're the kind of person that God wants to be with. One of these days, he's going to take you home too. Amen. He's going to do it because he prefers you. Why does he prefer you? Because you're in his son. Amen. Amen. Oh, this is, it's blessed me. God preferred the company of Enoch. You think about that. God prefers some people's company and he hates other people's company. In fact, he won't even smell their sacrifices. Well, I won't even, your sacrifice stinks to me. But he said to Cain, it, 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 I won't have any respect for it. I won't receive it. Now, moving forward in time, I want to ask a question. Is it possible for God to be sorry that he ever made man? Can men be so corrupt and so evil and so wicked that God can look down from heaven on the creatures that are made in the similitude and, and, of, of him and say, I wish I'd have never made you? Well, this is what he says. Let God speak for himself here. Genesis 6. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. God had a reaction when men preferred sin over his company. It grieved him. Well, so what's the Lord going to do about it? Is he going to sit up there and cry in heaven? He's really got to become acquainted with the real God. It's what he says. I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. That's what God said. Now, that's a pretty strong reaction, wouldn't you say? 
This is, but this is the way God feels about sin. You, you have a preference to walk in sin, God's going to hate you. This is the way it is. Is it possible for God to, in wrath, remember mercy? Right at the moment that, the, that his, his hatred for sin is at its peak, he remembers Noah. Right at that moment. So now we're living in an evil generation. There's evil all around us. But God will remember mercy in the midst of wrath. He, this is God now. See, God's wrath, it doesn't like override him. He can control it. Will God abandon his work? Will he, re, will he not remember to be gracious? Oh, he will. Is what it says, Genesis 6, 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, why did Noah find grace in the eyes of the Lord? Well, let's just keep reading. Noah was a just man. This is why he found grace now. A just man and perfect in his generation. And Noah walked with God. God had a preference for Noah. Now, right in the midst of this generation... Here's one man that God has kept, he has kept his feet. The whole time God's been with Noah. So now he's getting ready to destroy the world. Who does he go to to tell? Who does he go to to divulge this secret that I'm going to destroy the whole world? He goes to the one that he likes to be with. The one that he walks with. He goes to Noah. He says, Noah, you found grace in my eyes. Well, that wasn't like an overnight decision. He'd been walking with him. He's the one man. Well, God's not willing to abandon his project salvation. Not at all. What he's doing is going to clean off the surface of the face of the earth. Going to get things, going to get things ready now to start getting, because see, pretty soon here Abraham's going to come along. We've got to get things right because right now it's wrong. And God's going to get it right to where his purpose is going to be worked out. Out of the whole earth... I don't know how many was alive then. Brother Gibbons told us about this. It was a lot of people. Out of all the people, God chooses one man. Yeah. I can prove, I can only prove that God preferred one man on the face of the whole earth before the flood. Mm -hmm. And the other seven people were very, very, very happy that God did prefer him. Amen. I mean, we've all been through times like this. When somebody else got the blessing, but we got the benefits too because we were around them. Yeah. Noah was God's ordained man in his generation. Okay, let's jump ahead. There was a man named Abram. I'm trying to, 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 to show now that there are certain people down through history that even though sin hadn't been put away, just the very fact that it was going to be, see, he was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So now God's establishing now that there's a certain kind of person, kind of people that he prefers and a certain kind that he does not. Remember in Noah, God showed that a whole world could be saved because the faith of one man. I mean, you say, well, the whole world wasn't saved. Well, yeah, it was. We're, we're here, aren't we? He destroyed all of them who didn't have his favor, and he saved the one who did. And he went on, and we know the rest. He, he, he repopulated the whole world. Okay, here comes Abraham. Genesis 12, 1. That's what he says. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. I, I like these, this, all these I wills. This is God for you. This is God. He says, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God establishes with one man the things he's going to do, and it's going to way outlive his lifetime. This is God revealing. Why is he revealing it to Abraham? Because he's going to say, and Abram did what God asked him to do. He left this country. He believed the Lord. All right, so God's, God's getting ready to, to lay, he's laying down this foundation for us to think about for the rest of the time that we're here. Amen. No blessing of this magnitude has ever been given to any other man but Abraham. Abraham was given things that no other man has ever been given. Now, see, 
Christ comes along, and you understand now what Christ is doing because he established it in Abraham. He showed what he was going to do. He was going to gonna bless the whole world because Abraham's faith, what it said. God walked with Enoch. He had kept Noah alive when everything around him was dying. But now to Abram, God divulges a promise in which the only way for it to come pass is if God's with Abram. God didn't give Abram something that he was going to do. He said, you go out, and he didn't even tell him where to go. If he's going to arrive there, God's going to have to be with him, isn't he? Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, establishing that God is with those that he prefers. God was with Abram. You know, the whole way, the whole experience, the whole Abraham experience, God was with him. Otherwise, it couldn't have. He gave him something that he couldn't do. He couldn't have a child. He knew it. Sarah knew it. But God was with him. Amen. So he could. Yeah. Well, he asked you to do some things like that, too. He ordained them that they should be with him. Now, the same blessing was passed down. Uh, this, this, God started to expand this. You can see what God can do on one man, but how about what God can do on a whole nation? Can God prefer one nation above all other nations? Yeah, he can. He's proved it. Abraham started it, and it, but it didn't stay small. It became, it covered the face of the whole world. Same blessing passed on to Isaac, to Jacob, and the Holy Spirit condensed it and did so a few words. And listen to these few words. This is, this is God working with a single man that's going to turn into a whole nation. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after, after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out, not knowing whither he went. You, you caught that now, not knowing whither he went, which means God's going to have to go with him, all right? By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as a, in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Abraham even knew there's got to be more than this. I'm walking around this land, but this doesn't. This does not compare with I, what I can see that God's promised me. How did he get that information? We don't have any record where God told him anything else. It's that God was with him. He, God, you get God with you, and you get a lot. You get a lot of information. You get a lot of see a lot of things. God would speak to these people. For Abraham, from Abraham, a whole nation would emerge, and they, they would be known as the people of God. Now, look what God's done. Now he's from one man, this whole nation has emerged, and they're God conscious. Why? Because God is with them. This couldn't happen. This didn't happen by accident. This wasn't just like me passing down my family heritage to the next generation and then them picking it up and you know, you can see, you can imagine how, how easily and how quickly that would be defiled. And then it would be like, just, we don't even know anymore if Job came from here or from there. But see, this is not the way it was with Israel. Israel started out with Abram, and you have a very clear picture of a lineage all the way down, and they're God conscious. They know God because God's with them. God would speak to these people. God would speak to these people. Remember Exodus uh, 19.5. Now therefore, if you obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. Now this is not just one person. This is a nation. You'll be a peculiar treasure unto me. I I'm making this declaration to you now. Of course, they couldn't keep the commandment. But see, th this, was, this wasn't hinged on... On, on, on them, them keeping the commandment as much as it was God being with them. God was doing something that required them to, to he gave them a tabernacle, he gave them a way of, a means of worship to start developing their mind to think like God thinks. You shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the earth, for all the earth is mine. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation now these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Tell them this. Tell them that they'll be a treasure unto me. 
In other words, I'll prefer them. Nobody takes a treasure and throws it in the toilet. They don't do it. See, this was, God was developing a people that were actually God conscious. How do you do this? Well, we know he cleaned off the earth. You see what the condition it was when God didn't do anything with them, just left them to themselves. You see how soon the whole earth became corrupt. Well, now God's taken a little bitty nation from one man, and now he's got a nation of people who, that know the Lord. This is amazing. Amen. Even though the whole nation was a treasure to the Lord, the Lord would choose, even out of that, we can see that God even has more. Okay, he chose their whole thing, their treasure. And out of that, God chooses specific individuals. Now, this is the real God now. He, yeah. he has choices, and he chooses specific individuals in which he can show something of his nature, show some aspect of his person. He would choose specific people out of it that he would set his love upon. Well, Jacob would wrestle with an angel, and he wouldn't quit until he obtained a blessing. What was that? That was God preferring him. David would be a man after God's own heart. He would be called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He'd be the apple of God's. Why? Because God preferred him. Samuel would serve the Lord from a, from a very young age. I mean, he was, a pro, he was an impossible child, too. He was an answer to prayer. The Lord opened his, his mother's womb, and, he, and Samuel came out. And Samuel served the Lord his whole life. See, it was a blessing. Why? Because God preferred him. God, we would say God was with him. He was with him. Remember, if anyone ever wanted to know if God was capable of hating someone, he's given us an example. I mean, I've encountered a lot of people who say that God doesn't hate anybody. In fact, one man even told me God isn't capable of hating. They need to read the Bible. That's just a fact. They need, to re they need to come acquainted with the God who destroyed the whole world because of iniquity. He gave us lots of examples. Well, let's just look at one. There's Jacob and Esau. All right? Now, we can answer a lot of questions just with these two men. Is there some people that God prefers? Jacob, have I loved? There's there some people that God hates? Esau, have I hated? And how do you know it? Well, just look at what God did to him. Just look at how God treated him. Well, you would come to find out. God hated Esau. He laid his land waste. It's what he did. See, God would use these two men to reveal two different aspects of his nature. God doesn't work the same way with every single person. Now, we, um, see, why does God do this? Because we need to, we need to know these things about God. You know, we have, we, we have certain things in us that, that have to go. Why? Because God hates them. In other words, they'll stand in the way of God being with you. So now when you know that, well, then you purge yourself. I, don't want, I want to be purged from any of these things that would possibly stand in the way. Now, Romans 9, 11, it, it, it just stated so clearly here that this should just end anybody's disillusion about this. For the children, being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And the people of God said, Amen. That's the way it is. That's the way it is. We don't have to guess when it comes to these things. God's spoken about them. And any time God speaks on a subject, man has no right to teach something that is contrary to what God has said. Amen. And if they do, they'll just be judged for it. But see, it, they're turning men's minds to think a way that God hasn't ordained for them to think. When men have a problem with election or God's choices, basically that's what it is. Some people just don't even like the word. They've never looked into it. They just know that they're so-and-so told them that predestination is a bad word. That it's not true. Well, they just need to think about it. Think about it with God. We ever wondered, does God do special things for those that he chooses? Would God, would God show favor to someone that he chooses? Just look at Joseph. Just look at the life of Joseph. You would come to the conclusion that even if you're in jail, wrongly accused, 
There comes a time when you're come out and are set at the right hand of this, this king. How did that happen? Because God preferred him. God chose him. God was with him, in other words. What's my point? Well, there are some people that God does not want to be with. I know that sounds quite a negative, but that's just the way it is. It's your, it's your job to make sure you're not one of those people. If you can identify what kind of people God hates, you don't want to be like one of them at all costs. Now, we ever wondered about that? Just look at Cain, look at Esau, look at Pharaoh, look at Judas, look at Ananias and Sapphira, look at Herod. They, decided I'm going to kill one of, one of God's apostles. What did Jesus apostles? I'm going to kill him. Okay. You think you can get away with that? God hates these kinds of people. Well, he ordained 12 that they should be with him. All right. Now, there was something about these 12 men. You say, well, well they, they were born of a specific lineage, right? Well, yeah, they were Jewish men. But he ordained them. Now, that made them special right there. The very fact that, in other words, he chose them. These people were, were chosen to do a specific work at a specific time in history. And Jesus, it just so, it, he just walked along the sea. <laughs> I mean, he had already chosen them before, but the, this, it, their time came when they heard the master call, Come unto me, and I'll make you fishers of men. And they did. Now, he ordained 12. As I was thinking about that, just to highlight that this is not a common thing, consider Moses. Now, this Moses gives us a good example. When God ordains, when God sets some apart for a work, there are special people. That's just the way it is. Now, some people around them may not see them as special. Some people around them may think, they're just like everybody else. Why can't I have what they have? All right, let's see what Moses says about this. Remember, I'm commenting on the fact that not all men are considered the same with the Lord. All right, there came a time when Aaron and Miriam didn't understand the distinction that God had made in, in, in um, Moses. It counts in Numbers 12. They said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? And the Lord heard it. The, 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 the Lord, he's got a good ear. He can hear. And they heard, they heard what they said to Moses. Now the man of Moses was very meek. Above all men of the, which were on the face of the earth, very meek man, God's going to stand up now for this very meek man. God's going to speak for him. And the Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, Come out, ye three, unto the tabernacle of the congregations. And they three came out. Now, remember, this was because they couldn't detect that God was working in Moses. They couldn't see the distinction that God had made. Now, they should have, but they didn't. And the Lord came out in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forth. Right away, God makes a distinction. You two come forward. We're going to have to give an account now for what you just said to my servant Moses. Now, remember that Miriam and Aaron, they wanted to be distinct, right? Well, God's made them distinct now. He's called them forward. You think you can handle it? Come on, come forward. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so, who is faithful in all mine house. With him I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches. And the similitude of the Lord shall, be, shall he, and the similitude of the Lord shall he behold. He sees me clearly. Wherefore, why weren't you afraid to speak against him? Because this is a, the way it is, because I prefer Moses over every other man, why did you speak against him? That's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and he departed. Now, it may not have seemed at the moment that he departed that anything else was going to happen. Just like a, I got, you know, he really... 
gave it to me, didn't he? Well, that wasn't the end. Now, God had, has amply demonstrated that he's, a, he's, he's, he's actually offended at what they've done. This offended God because they spoke against the one that God had ordained. God had set him apart. Now, ultimately, we can see this in Christ Jesus. If they haven't received Christ, they're gonna do, this same thing's going to happen someday. It's just there's going to be no remedy then. And the cloud departed from off the tabernacle, and behold, Miriam became leprous, white as snow. And Aaron looked upon Miriam and said, Behold, she was leprous. And Aaron said unto Moses, Alas, my Lord, I beseech thee. Now all of a sudden, they're going to Moses. <laughs> now, they, really, if they would have thought about it, they've been doing this all along. Every time any kind of trouble broke out, they ran to Moses. And they asked Moses to intercede for them. But now, see, this is the way flesh is. This is the way it is. Is that it, you, if you don't see the, if, you don't, if I look at you and all I see is a man, I'm probably going to mistreat you. I'm probably not going to treat you, but if I can see that God's working in you. See, this is, that's why we don't want to know each other after the flesh. We don't want to see each other just purely after, after what we can see with our eyes. Now, if, you, if, you're, if you're serious and you, and you start weighing, how much has this person edified me? They had plenty of, I mean, think of all the times that, um, that they should have known who they were talking to. They should have. He was the one that God sent to them and delivered them from the land of Egypt. Yeah. This is the one that showed up, told them. God appeared to me. He told me, give me the, he delivered them, brought them out of Egypt. And now what are they doing? They're saying, is God only spoken through you? Well, these are the, this is the same man now that came down from the top of the mountain. And he had the tablets in his hands, and his face was shown like the sun. This is the same man. Why am I going through this? Because it was very apparent, if they had just thought about it, that it was evidences that God had preferred this man. It was evidences that God was with this man. But not at this moment. This was the same man that after a fire from the Lord had consumed those who complained in Numbers 11, Moses prayed and the Lord quenched the fire. The same man did that. And yet, you can see how easily flesh can forget. Yes. Why can't I be just like you? I can tell you, anybody who's ever preached has had this temptation to think, well, why can't I see things? Well, you know, God's given you a ministry. He has. And that ministry is to do what he sent you to do. We have many examples of what God has given us in his word concerning the treatment of those who he prefers. Remember, one of the prophets, he put his feet in stocks. And they hurt his feet. You think God forgot about that? He hasn't forgotten about it. It's going to be remedied. It's going to be brought up. How about all the people who just ignored the words that you said to them? You told them about Christ. You lived Christ before them. And they not only rejected you, they spoke evil against you. Maybe they, they went and said, well, they're, they don't really, they're not really serious over there. You think God didn't hear that? Well, he heard it. Remember Daniel? Now, I don't have time to go into all these, brethren. I know that. I would sure like to. But, but Daniel, remember, he was, he was greatly beloved. That's what he, the, angel, the angel come to him. And he said, oh, Daniel, greatly, greatly beloved. Uh, he, that was the opinion from heaven. That may not have been the opinion of the people who wanted to throw him into the lion's den, right? Daniel, greatly beloved. God told Ezekiel, remember one time God told Ezekiel, though Daniel, Noah, or Job ask, I wouldn't hear him. They'd only save their own soul. So see, there's some people that God prefers, and that preference, well, along with the preference, comes benefits. You can get in Christ Jesus. You got all the benefits. They're all right there. Now, see, does that mean that you, I'm in Christ now, and so I know everything? Well, we had an example of that this morning, didn't we? You can be in Christ Jesus and not know everything. You can be in Christ Jesus and have to be under where somebody sees something more clearly. You have to be able to receive it when they say it, right? Right? This is the way it is in Christ. The, the body works 
the joints and bands, they're all working together. To do what? To glorify God. Amen. See, ultimately, God is the main, the main one, is God. He's the one that's doing all the work, but he's using those he prefers to get it done. Those that he's with. Now, Jesus has ordained, at that time, he had ordained 12. Now, I want to just take a few minutes here, and I'll, I'll finish this up. I want to take a few minutes to deal with directly who he was talking about when he, when, when he said this. He ordained 12. He went up to a mountain, and he called them whom he would, and they came to him. There wasn't any doubt that they were going to come to him. They came to him. Why? Because he called them. That's why. And he ordained 12 that they should be with him. Though there wasn't really any other better place for them to be because he called them to be with them. To be with, to be, be with him. Who did he call? He called Simon, called Peter, James, and John. These were the sons of Zebedee. <laughs> I like the, the sons of thunder. This is the, the sons of commotion. They got something done. Anyway, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, some think it was Jude, but anyway, um, Simon, the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which will also betray him. These are the men that Jesus chose out of the world to accomplish a specific purpose in the earth. Mainly at the point, this point in time, it was to be with him. Now, I, I'm, I'm, as I thought about this, they wouldn't have got the other purpose done had they not been with him. That's right. The three years that they were with him, they were with him all the time. Day and night, they were with him. It wasn't like, okay, it's 4 o'clock now, I'm going to go back to my house. No, no. <laughs> they, they, they would be maybe be on the other side of the lake by that time. No, this, this was a full-time thing. What was, what was Christ showing us? That people with him aren't their own anymore. Yeah. They left everything. Why? So they could be with him. Now, anybody who's been with Christ for any amount of time knows that there is no better place to be. There is no other. Peter wasn't wishing he could be at home. They, they, had, they had never encountered this before. This, they knew they were waiting for the, for the consolation of Israel. They were waiting for this. Remember, Andrew went and told them, we found him. We found him. They come and see. We, we found him. Why? They wanted, they wanted to be with him. Now, I see, after he rose from the dead, after they received the Holy Spirit, then these things, the three years that they were with him, there was a lot of things they didn't get at the moment. Jesus himself said, there's a lot of things I'd, I would say to you. You can't receive them now, but, but, after I'm risen from the dead, you're, it's just like their understanding just increased. This is that. This is what he was talking about. Peter said, we were with him on the holy mount. We went up there. I can tell you about it. See, Peter, he wasn't, he never denied the Lord again. This was one time, and he would tell you right to your face, I was with him on the holy mountain. All of these men cost them their life. Yeah. These men didn't have any other dreams. They didn't have any other desires. Right. They, had, they had seen this Holy One. They had been with Him. And when, they, when it dawned on them what had happened, they went about preaching everywhere. Yeah. Why? Because they knew they saw the significance of being with Jesus. Amen. Well, until this, really, see, until this happens, until the day dawn, the dawns and, and the day start rising in your heart, and you see, I'm with Jesus. I'm with Jesus. There's not any place else I would like to be. All these, all these brethren, this is like a tribute. What they did, they lived out what we're doing now. And it all cost them their life. Now, every one of them was martyred except for John, the beloved. These men would, they would eat with Jesus, go everywhere he went. And there came a time when they would have to die with Jesus. See, now, Peter, when he was martyred, he wouldn't even let them, this is history now, it's Fox's Book of Martyrs. He wouldn't even let them 
crucify him the way that Jesus said. He wasn't worthy. So they crucified him upside down. James, he was beheaded by Herod. That's, we have a scripture for that one. John, James' brother, he was the only one who escaped the violent death. Andrew, he was taken and crucified on a cross. Philip, he was scourged, thrown into prison, and afterwards crucified. Bartholomew, he was cruelly beaten and then crucified by idolaters in India. Matthew, being slain with a halberd, a halberd in Ethiopia. Thank you. Thomas, he preached the gospel in India. He excited the rage of pagan priests, and he was martyred for and being thrust through with a spear. James, the son of Alphaeus, at the age of 94, was beaten and stoned by the Jews and finally had his brains dashed out with a fuller's club. Thaddeus was martyred. AD 65, Simon the Canaanite, he was crucified in Britain. Matthias, he was stoned at Jerusalem and then beheaded. Paul, after his prayers made, gave his neck to the sword. These men, they lived what they believed. Now, I tell you, until you're willing to do that, until you're willing to crucify the flesh, you're not going to be with him. Amen. Now this is, um, I know that everyone here in, in my hearing has done this. You, you, you love to be with Jesus. I, I can testify. I've witnessed it. But we're living in a time when this message needs to go out. Amen. It needs to go out again. <laughs> that in order to be with Jesus, you have to deny yourself, you take up your cross, and follow after him. And if you do it, if you do it, he's outside the camp. He's waiting. He, he's there. If you'll just leave the world, he's there because he's not in the world. He's outside the world. So if you leave it, if you give it up, you're never going to give it up in vain because he'll be with you. Now, we've seen just in a few minutes here that God does special things for those that he's with. If, and and if, you, if you want something special from God, then get close to his son. Because if you get close to him, he'll bring you to the father. Every time he brings you to the father. Why? Because this is what he was ordained. See, he, God ordained him, sanctified him, sent him into the world. Why? That he might bring many sons to glory. Why? Because God wants to be with them. Amen. We know that in the end, God himself, he's declared this. God himself will be with them. John 17, 24, and I'll close with this verse. And then this, is, brings, this brings you into the equation. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. I, I, from the very beginning, I came to do your will, O oh God. I came to do this because of what was going to happen in the end. Because of what was going to be the result of me laying down my life, entering into the holiest with my blood, making the application, and then bringing the sons home. And we're on our way. This is, someday, it's going to be the last day. And we're going to be present with the Lord. And no one's going to be saying, it's not what I thought it would be. You're going to be shouting the glory. Amen. I had victory over that old flesh. Well, praise God for Jesus. Amen.